Welcome to the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast, where each week we speak with brands, icons, innovators, and trailblazers within the fly fishing industry, exploring both the successes and failures they've encountered along the way to become who they are today. But first, if you have not yet subscribed to the podcast or joined our email list, please do so by going to the Fly Fisher Insider Podcast.com, where you can also find us on Instagram at Fly Fisher Insider Podcast. Now let's begin. Welcome to the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. Today our guest is Lance Egan. Lance, you're a longtime uh, competition nymph angler. Uh, you were a Team USA. I almost said Team Canada for some reason there, Lance. Uh, with Team USA. <laughs> <laughs> and you're from Utah. You're here today to talk about some uh, nymphing tips, techniques, tr- you know, just everything nymphing. But uh, I, you know, I'm super excited. So how's it going? It's going great. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, no worries. I'm, I'm definitely excited about this one. So um, I know last week we had uh, Devin on, and uh, here's the follow-up to that. So whatever between the two of you guys, I mean, we should be dialed for nymphing. So definitely got the best in the business. Awesome. So hey, Lance, before we jump into the tips and techniques and, and um, top skills and whatnot to put people onto fish, what? how do you get into fly fishing? Like, what's your backstory, and how did you get to the level that you're at? Uh, well, I got into fly fishing because I just liked fishing. Uh, I don't come from a a family of anglers, so I just kind of had to take fishing by the horns and just learn it as I went. I had, uh, a friend of mine that when I was in my young teenage years, uh, that got a fly tying kit for Christmas and I was interested in fishing, but I hadn't really ever tried fly fishing and thought that tying flies was really neat. So I got involved in tying flies first and then, uh, really just started getting into fishing afterward and once I could drive I was off fishing every chance I got and I've just kind of been doing it ever since awesome how long ago was that like, uh, was that was yeah that was when I was a kid I'm in my 40s now so that was what about 30 years ago <laughs> Crazy life, lifelong, lifelong I love it so then when did so when did the competition aspect start kicking in uh, I started doing some really local competitions in, let's see, maybe the mid to late nineties. And I started doing casting competitions first. Uh, I did a lot of the best of the West casting competitions. And then I did some, uh, what would you call them? ESPN great outdoor games and versus channel or outdoor channel used to have their fly fishing masters competitions that combined casting with fishing. I did some of those, and those were kind of my introductions to, to competition fishing. Uh, and then I, I learned about Fly Fishing Team USA and um, have made an effort to make that team and then have been able to luckily stay on that team ever since. Nice. That's awesome, buddy. So then when, like, so you're doing that, you're, you're out there, your competition, when did, you, you know, it come home to you the, of what you're doing? I think we're out. I'm trying to go with this here. So let me... Let me rephrase. We're going to cut all that. Lance, so after competition, what, what, what was the next step for you? What's the natural progression for you after that? Uh, well, I guess I still compete. Uh, I didn't in, tw- in this year, of course, with COVID stuff. Uh, 2020 was, was a total loss as far as competition goes. But, uh, I competed in the world championships last fall in Tasmania and, I've just been trying to uh, decide how much longer I want to compete. Um, but all the while, I mean, your com- competition fishing is just a very small part of the year. You know, I mean, you might compete in four or five competitions a year, uh, at least for me. Some people do more than that. But for me, that's kind of about where I've settled in. So most of the year is just fun fishing and, and experiencing new places and different techniques and uh, always trying to learn. So, I, you know, I guess I would describe my next steps from, from competition fishing is that I'm always working on getting better at all of the techniques that I like to use and, uh, and always looking for new water and new ways to catch fish. Awesome. And I know you're also involved with like the teaching aspect and you guys have, um, when I say you guys, you and you and Devin have released some videos or you, and you also have some videos as well, um, that teach people how to, how to fish, um, particularly nymph fishing. 
Yeah, yeah, we have our Modern Nymphing and Modern Nymphing Elevated videos that are available on Vimeo or in a DVD form, and they are strictly nymph fishing. And then we did our third video that we, we released this last year, uh, the, well, earlier this year, I should say, that is a little more well-rounded. It has some dry fly, some dry dropper, some nymphing, and some streamer techniques. So all river angling, but uh, but yeah, a little more well-rounded instead of just nymphing. So we, we certainly... Uh, I think Devin would agree. We've both, Devin Olson I'm referring to, Devin and I have been teammates and friends a long time, and we would agree that we've learned a great deal from competition fishing and from the the motivation to get better at, at competing because when we first got involved with Team USA stuff, Team USA was not doing very well, and so we were motivated to change that. And to do so, we had to really learn a lot ourselves and, and improve our fishing. And uh, in the process, we've learned a lot along the way. And we have just tried to make an effort to share some of that to uh, help everybody else catch more fish, too. That's what everybody wants to do when they're out fishing is catch fish. So it's been a fun process to take some of what we've learned and share it. Absolutely. You know, it's funny, um, you know, taking that information and learning to share it and whatnot. So, yeah, I'm going to hit you for some tips. But I've noticed, like, this with European nymph fishing or or Euro nymph style fishing, like you guys have, it's kind of like exploding or it's really coming to fruition here. Um, This year, particularly Mm -hmm. many manufacturers, uh, line manufacturers have created specific lines for that. Um, I I know Sage Mm -hmm. has uh, the ESN fly rod for that. I mean, there's many Mm -hmm. manufacturers are designing particular, specifically for that style of fishing uh winston has their the super tens i mean and i think there's a few others um out there i'm probably forgetting but i mean yeah. it's definitely coming to light and what like why do you think that is why do you think this and i don't want to say trend because i i think it's here to stay so why do you think that style of fishing is getting is, is a bit in the spotlight right now uh, I think just from my own experience talking to, you know, the anglers that I've guided over the years, as well as people I've worked with in the shop, the reason that I think it's taking off is that people find that it's incredibly effective. It's a really, really good way to cover water and it opens up a bunch of water types that you, that most people were not very adept at covering before. You know, most, most anglers, at least in the greater Intermountain West area where I've spent most of my time fishing. Uh, most people are indicator nymphers, you know, as far as their day in day out stuff, of course there's dry fly guys and, and gals and streamer folks as well. And, uh, uh, you know, there, everybody has their preferences, but by and large, the, the majority of the people that are fishing all, all the time spend a fair bit of time nymph fishing. And, uh, most of them are fishing indicator rigs that are really good at fishing deeper water, deeper pools, maybe slower water, but aren't very good at fishing pocket water or, areas with lots of conflicting currents, uh, not as good at fishing really shallow water or fast water. And the Euro system allows you to cover all of those water types really, really efficiently. So I I think it's just blowing up because people have a lot of success with it. It is a very effective way to cover a lot of water, like you mentioned, for sure. So if I was to get into this style of fishing, like where would I start? Like how, like walk us through the, you know, the, the set, I don't want to say set up, like walk us through the steps necessary or what will we be looking for or tips in order to, to help us uh, grow within this uh, style of fishing? Well, you would need some gear that's specific to it. Uh, the most common question we get asked when people want to try your own thing is, will my regular fly rods work? And while the answer is yes, I always uh, kind of make the parallel to golf. Like you, you know, how well can you drive a golf ball with a putter? Uh, not very well, right? You, you need the right tool for the job. Can you do it? Yeah, but you can't hit it nearly as far. You don't have nearly as much control. Can you hit a golf ball really hard with a putter? You absolutely can. And the same would apply, you know, maybe not quite to that extreme, but the same would apply to a fly rod. If you're buying, or let's say you already have a nine foot five or a nine foot, or it doesn't matter, even a 10 foot five or six weight, which is most common for our trout anglers in the West, uh, you know, say a nine foot five weight. Can you Euro nymph with that? You can, but it's too short. It's too stiff. It doesn't cast the Euro rig very well. So, it, you know, first and foremost, you need to get a long light rod. So most commonly a 10 to 10 and a half, let's say, foot uh, three weights most common, but two to four weight would be the uh, kind of the range of sizes that are popular. Three weight being the most common. Crazy. Uh, next up. Next up, I would say you need a reel. Uh, you know, pretty basic reel will do the trick. You just need a reel that, that balances the rod. So 
the most common mistake I see there is that people think I've got a three weight rod. I need a three weight reel and you don't really want a three weight reel. You want a reel that's going to balance the long rod. So if you have a 10 or 10 and a half foot three weight, you probably need a reel that's normally designed to cast or sorry, not to cast to hold a uh, five or six weight line to properly balance that rod. So we sell a lot of 10, 10 and a half threes with a five, six reel. After the reel, you want to fill it with a nice thin Euro line. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, there are lots of, uh, basically every line manufacturer now makes a, uh, a really thin Euro specific fly line. So they're, you know, they're significantly thinner than your regular fly line. So even if you took like a zero weight fly line or a one or a two weight fly line, it would be thinner than the running line of a weight forward two or a three or a zero. It's a really, really thin line. So that helps because it uh, has less sag in the guides and it has less sag out of the rod. So when you're fishing a long way away where you have the fly line out the rod tip, uh, the, the Euro specific lines have a lot less weight to them. So they don't sag and droop as much as a regular fly line would. Uh, they're also thin. So they slide through the guides a little easier. So that's next up. And then you just need some leader building materials to kind of finish the set. So, uh, uh, I like to use a lot of Maxima Chameleon or Sunset Amnesia for leader building materials. You'll need some sort of cider material. Cider is the, the colored line that's the, your kind of your visual aid that you're going to use to detect strikes. And then uh, some tippet rings are very popular for Euro setups where you connect the cider to a very thin tippet. And then just some fluorocarbon tippet of your, you know, your brand of choice. Cool. So Other than that, you need yeah. a bunch of you need a bunch of flies, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, so it's it's relatively easy to to get into. I mean, it's you know you're switching rods, and uh, most people have a five weight reel. Um, you know, again, like you said, I guess yes. it's, it's balancing. So it's a it's a rod and a line. Um, you know, which is probably much pretty much uh, what would be needed for that regard. Yeah, yeah, it's really basic. I agree. It, it's you can do it. You know, as you mentioned, to some of the high end manufacturers. So. ESN style rods and we also have them from pretty uh, inexpensive value type rods. So, mm-hmm. you know, in the shop I work at here in fly fish food in Orem, Utah, we have, we have people all day, every day that are coming in and getting Euro setups and we sell the most kind of value rods. I would say the majority of the rods we sell are sub $500, you mm-hmm. know, a lot of them in the two to $300 range and like, you know, 80 to uh, maybe most common reels are probably 99 bucks, uh, but you know, $80 reels, maybe $200 reels. And then, uh, the lines are around $50. So it could be expensive if you wanted to add a eight or $900 rod to that, but you could keep it pretty reasonable for, you know, reasonable is a relative thing for fly fishing gear, but you could keep the overall investment pretty low, really. Which is awesome. I mean, if you're going to get into it, if you like it, I mean, say a guy's technically, or say a fly fisher is technically, you know, a streamer chucker, and then they, they want to get into something a bit different just to cover different water and whatnot. Um, yeah, I agree. So yeah, what, what are some other aspects that I would be looking for to, um, to, to get into the sport? Like I can't, now I got my setup, I go to the river. What am I looking at? Uh, so the last thing you really got to have is a, a, selection of flies so you, you got to have flies of various weights so with european nymphing as you know you're not using any weight added to the leader except for flies so we're not adding split shot to the leader so you just got to have you know weights that will accommodate different depths so you need lightweight flies that are weighted but not crazy heavy when you're fishing shallow um, or slow water and when it's really fast or really deep you might need some really heavy flies and everything between so having a good collection, a good you know selection of, of weighted flies is a must. What other tips can you share with us for uh, effective Euro nymphing? Uh, I would I would argue that the most common mis- well that's not called a mistake. The most common hurdle that I encounter when I'm trying to teach people Euro nymphing is casting, uh, and I don't think this is limited to just Euro nymphing. Uh, this is true certainly with dry flies, with indicator nymphing, with uh, Still water, no doubt. Uh, just casting in general. I would argue that most fly fishers have a real, real opportunity to get better at casting. Uh, and Euro nymphing is is no exception there. You know, most of the time when I'm guiding folks, trying to teach them the technique, they we spend two or three hours trying to just get the basic cast down. And it is an awkward and hard rig to cast. Fully admit that, but but it's uh, with a few really basic you know, 
for casting, let's call them, uh, I don't know what you want to call them, just, just execution pieces. You just got, you just have to execute a few really basic skills to make the cast work. And, you know, in a nutshell, the easiest way to, to describe what I think is the best way to cast the Euro rig is to take flies under the rod on the back cast and over the rod on the forward cast. So you're, your fly is going back or under, and then you're waiting for eternity for the, it seems anyway, for the leader to turn over behind you. And then once the flies turn over behind you, then you can take them forward over the rod tip. And then keeping in mind that there's uh, we talk about this in our videos a lot. There's a, a casting principle that's called the 180 degree rule that if you want your flies to go, you know, to a particular place, you need to take your back cast 180 degrees from where you want them to end up because they, they, the long lead leader does not uh, have a lot of stiffness and mass to be able to change direction. So you got to change direction with your back cast, and then the exact opposite direction will be an accurate forward cast, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. Now, do the, in the thin lines, they help? do they help lay that cast out a bit further, or like a bit smoother? Not really, because there won't be very much fly line out of the rod tip. Uh, most of the time I have a foot to maybe five feet of fly line out the tip of the rod at the beginning of each cast. And then you'll, re you'll retrieve that line. I like the fly line because I like to manage line. I like to okay. take a slack by holding fly line. And I like to set the hook by pinching the fly line against the cork handle. And I like to fight fish by holding fly line. So the fly line is, is really thin to minimize sag and drag, but it's, it's not really going to push the, the cast through the air like a traditional fly cast would. So you're really counting on the, the action of the rod then, the load. Very much so. Yeah, yeah. that's where that long light rod really helps a lot. Yeah. It has to be able to, to load under its own weight rather than the weight of the rod bending it. I'm sorry, rather than the weight of the line bending it is what I meant to say. Mm -hmm. Well, that's got to be different for a lot of people out there. I mean, like, and I can see, I can see a challenge on that for sure. I mean, when you're guiding or, or taking people out, um, you know what I mean? Definitely, definitely. Cause it's, it is a different style of casting for sure. So Super. it's very different. And then uh, our muscle memory from our regular cast, that's correct. So a lot of folks, for instance, at the end of a regular, whether you're fishing a dry or a dry dropper or an imp rig or whatever, will just water load or they will, uh, roll cast a lot. You know, you finish a drift and you kind of get the line off the water and into the air to start the next cast by rolling it from kind of a, your line is slightly downstream of you and you roll cast it up into the air. Then you might make a couple of false casts and then lay the cast down. And with the long Euro system with a 20 foot leader, it doesn't have enough stick. You know, it doesn't stick like fly line does on the surface. So you can't really roll cast it. So a lot of the muscle memory that we're used to using that's correct with a standard cast is not correct with the Euro mm -hmm. cast. So you have to relearn some of those basic skills again. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt for sure. Definitely uh, taking it up a level. I like that. What else do you have, Lance? Any other uh, useful tidbits of information here to help us out? Sure. Yeah. I think uh, the next thing I would talk about for your nymphing as far as just a tip that, that I see most people struggle with is just keeping the cider off the water. So if you haven't urinymphed before, the cider is a highly visible piece of, of uh, monofilament that is built into the leader, usually near the, the terminal end, maybe four to six feet away from the end of the, where the flies are, if you will. Uh, and it's something that is so visible that that's what we're watching to detect strikes. So the cider ideally stays off the water the entire cast. And I'm amazed at how often I tell people that, and we talk about it in our videos, and we talk about, making the cast and finishing with the rod high to keep the leader and the cider off the water. And then it's amazing how often I see people out fishing or when I'm guiding, how often the clients do not do that. And all day long, I'm telling them, get the cider up, get the cider up, keep the cider off the water, get that cider up all day long. And it's, uh, it's a really basic thing, but it's not very, again, it's not intuitive. You're used to making a cast where you, whether you're false casting a dry or a streamer or whatever, you tend to end with the rod pretty low. And with the Euro system, you got to finish with that rod high, keep that cider off the water. And what that does is it allows your flies to descend immediately. When they hit the water, they're immediately falling to the bottom and you are immediately in contact with them. And as they fall, you're ready to detect a strike and set the hook rather than what mo what I see most people do is lay the cast out, finish with the rod too low. All of the leader and the cider land on the water 
the flies start to descend and then they lift the rod to li- to kind of rip all of that leader and cider back up off the water. The flies in turn get lifted in the water column mm-hmm. and they're not looking very natural when they're doing that rather than just drifting at the mercy of the current. The flies are not getting to depth where we want them to, to drift. And they're also being, uh, you know, twitched, if you will, from the fish's point of view, they've got drag or they're, they're swimming, uh, unnaturally because they hit the water, start to fall and then they lift back up, uh, and lift towards the surface. And then they finally start to descend again. And that second, uh, you know, that, that second ascent still works. You can still catch fish during that time, but you're missing a whole bunch of strikes that come as the flies fall and you're not allowing them to get to depth as fast because you're, they're falling and lifting and falling again, if that makes sense. And so again, to yeah, fix that yeah. problem, you, you just gotta, you just gotta stop with the rod high. So you, you move the cast when you make the forward cast to deliver the flies, you can take the rod low to send the flies where you want them to go. But while the leader and flies are turning over while they're still in the air, you lift that rod back up to a, a higher angle to keep the back end of that leader and, and cider off the water. Mm-hmm. That is a crucial part of, of being in contact and, and really a pretty basic Euro nymphing technique, but, it's one that most people really struggle with. So that would be my number one tip for sure. Keeping that cider off for sure. I like that. What else? Keep the cider off the water. What else have you, so when you guys are talking about this in your, in your videos and whatnot, this is all stuff that you've obviously mentioned and whatnot. And you show techniques and tips and you show the proper technique of casting and, and you know, the, yeah. Do you show, do you get into the, you know, you, where it's like, here's what you don't want to do. And, and you give examples, like, are you doing it like that? Like yeah. for that, for that cast? Most definitely. Cause I'm a visual person. I am picturing this as you're talking, but I mean, I, I mean, for some people, I mean, they just need to see it for sure. You know what I mean? And I'm with you. I'm a visual learner too. Yeah, absolutely. So what yeah. else do you guys, and what, it, it, yeah. to answer your question, that is all in the videos for sure. Sorry right. to talk over you there, but yeah, yeah that is, that's in there. And, the it shows you some tips and some of the mis- common mistakes for sure. Cool. So Lance in the videos, what else are you guys talking about? Any, any other tips you can share with us today? Yeah. So uh, let's talk a little bit about leader design in our first video, modern nymphing. We shared some uh, basic leaders to get people started. They're thicker leader designs to help people uh, transition from the regular taper leaders that we're all used to using, which are quite thick on the butt section. And, uh, so like the leader formula that I shared in our first video is, uh, 20 pound, 15 pound and 12 pound maxima chameleon, Mm -hmm. about 42 inches of each, and then a little bit of cider and a tippet ring. And then you just have tippet from there. And that's a great starting point because it will have a little more power, if you will, for the delivery. So you'll have more accuracy with the cast, but then, uh, you know, trending more towards our second video modern nymphing elevated we started fishing slightly thinner leaders to kind of help people realize that they needed to also graduate to thinner and thinner leader designs and then in our most recent video adaptive fly fishing we talk about what we call the micro leader which is really really thin leader all the way from the fly line down uh thin is a relative term so you know to put that in perspective maybe somewhere between uh 4x diameter 5x diameter or maybe as thick as like 2x or so 1x diameter material Um, and you're not necessarily using 1x tippet but you're using monofilament that is equal diameter so 4x is seven thousandths of an inch for instance that's what uh, Devin and I mostly have been using the last couple of years Uh, use that thin leader and what you don't want to do is go right from using your standard fly rod and go right to the micro leader because you'll have a heck of a time controlling it because when you start getting thinner and thinner with the with the leaders you lose directional control. I was just going to ask you that. I was going to ask you, like, as a beginner, should I just jump right into what you and Devin are using, or should I just jump into the micro leaders, or should you do the, was it the 40, 20, 12? Is that what you said? Uh, 20, 15, 12, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, don't, I would go, you don't have to go quite that thick if you don't want the 20, 15, 12. The 20, 15, 12 is a really versatile leader because you could use it to throw a dry dropper. It's stiff enough to actually even turn over a, a single dry fly as well. Uh, it just has more sag when you're trying to nymph. So like most of my guiding clients, I'm using uh, like eight or 10 pound amnesia, which is probably in the neighborhood. I don't actually know what the diameters of that stuff is, but I would guess that it's in the diameter of about, you know, eight pound amnesia is probably around, oh, like, O2 or O3X, so like two two thousandths of an inch thicker than zero X, if that makes sense. 
somewhere in there. Yeah, it's a lot of technicality. That's probably here, like yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, 012, oh, yeah. 013, somewhere in there, of an inch diameter, um, you know, where 0X is 011. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, it, that's kind of, a, I find that's a happy medium to get people, you know, where I'm on their shoulder being able to tell them, you know, cats like this, not like that. I can get them to work with that leader where even my, my really skilled clients uh, really struggle with the 4X diameter leader. It's really hard to direct where it's going. Accuracy is really, really tough. The reason people do it, the reason we go that light is because it has so much less weight that it has less sag. So you can fish, you know, a 4X diameter leader a lot farther away than you could a 0X diameter leader and with lighter flies. So it has its advantages, but it also has its disadvantages. Oh, I get it for sure. So, so leader's important. Uh, rod's important. Line's important. You're, we're talking mm-hmm. about flies. Uh, what else have we covered here? Um, there's quite a few, quite a few. Yeah, uh, we talked casting. Casting. Yeah, absolutely. Keeping, keeping the tips up. Um, what, what else do you have for us to put us successfully onto, uh, to fish? I think you mentioned that Devin, uh, you know, we talked a lot about reading water, but, uh, you know, reading water and learning how to, uh, to use the system in various water types is your natural inclination. If you've not done this before is to just go fish the Euro system in the exact same place you would indicate an mm-hmm. And that's a good starting point. But, uh, I think it's important to note that it, the Euro system will allow you to fish much, much shallower and much tighter to banks. Um, you know, be a lot more accurate with the cast once you get control of it because you don't have flies, indicators, split shot, all kinds of things of different uh, densities that are, you know, winding around. You just can't take a, an indicator rig and place it in a 10 inch wide seam with overhanging brush right on a bank with the flies and split shot and indicator and everything else all falling in line over there very easily. Is it possible? Yeah, it's probably possible. But if you just have a single nymph or two weighted flies, and leader the rest of the way up, you can very easily with a little bit of practice, tuck those two little flies right on that little teeny seam on an edge and, uh, you know, cover a little bank side lie, which is one of the segments that we have in our adaptive fly fishing. Uh, if you've watched that video, you'll know what I'm talking about there, but we fish some really tight edges and the difference between catching fish is sometimes getting the flies, you know, two inches from the bank instead of six or eight inches from the bank. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, um, yeah, I, I'm I'm so fascinated with how much is going on here with uh, Euro nymphing and whatnot. You guys are doing so, you know, teaching me so much, and I, like I'm so new to uh, to it. And over the past two days, when I see you guys, both you and Devin, right, um, have taught me so much about it. What it what is it that you like about it? And that's something I, I should have asked earlier in the show. But what is it that you like about it that, um, you know, you just you're so knowledgeable and passionate about it. I can tell in your voice. Uh, Euro nymphing. I, I think the thing I like about it the most is that it allows me to fish lots of water types, cover various water types, and uh, it's just really effective. But for me, I just catch a lot more fish uh, using that technique in my local waters, and uh, than I did with indicators. And it also, um, it's very tactile. I like the connection that I have with the with the Euro system, where I, you know, I'm not the type of person that will say I don't indicate a nymph. I don't do it very much because I don't think in very many situations it's the better technique, but there are times and places or conditions where an indicator is a better rig, but I like Euro nymphing because of its versatility. And I think that it's a little more tactile, maybe a little more, uh, I'm struggling to find the right word, but a little more personal as far as I feel like I'm in touch more with what's going on. And I, I, I have better feel for where my flies are in relation to the bottom and better strike detection. And I like those things. It's, it's a little more technical to do, but I think once you get a little command of the cast and a little understanding of the technique, it all of a sudden becomes really, really fun because it opens up so much water that you used to walk right by. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's important to note though, that it's not the end all be all. I, you know, when you say, what is it I like about it so much for, you know, for me, I've done so much of that last few years that my favorite things to do right now are fish drives and uh, fish streamers, which is not really new. Uh, that's some of my favorite things to do for my, entire fly fishing life, but I love to fish lakes. I spend most of the summer fishing dries. Uh, I've been fishing streamers a lot lately. Again, this fall, I tend to fish streamers a lot spring and fall. 
Uh, and then I tend to fish still water a lot spring and fall. So it's, you know, it's just the, the nymphing is really fun, but it's just one thing to learn. And that's the great thing about fly fishing, right, Greg, that you get absolutely never ending learning process. There's just too much to, to take in. We'll never know it all. I feel like that's the case for me right now, just with your, your quick tips there. I mean, it's just so much information absorbed on, on nymphing. But like you say, like I'm passionate about still water as well. And you know, there's salt water, mm-hmm. there's, there's rivers, like, there's so many different ways. And that's like you said, there's the, that's the beauty of fly fishing is all these different techniques. So what is it? Um, For sure. when, when you are out there still water fly fishing, um, what style of fly, um, still water are you doing? Are you anchored? Are you doing walk style? Or are you just having fun? Are you, Walk, walk me through that. Um, I do a little bit of both. I do the most lock style fishing, but we do, uh, I guess, I don't anchor very much, but my boat has a uh, spot lock, if you're familiar with that, with the trolling, electric trolling motor. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's kind of GPS locks into a place. So we do a bit of that. Uh, I did a lot of that this year where we would fish dries on still water mm-hmm. and just find you know structure, either shallow bays, or points or things of that nature, you know, particular types of structure and then hang just the cast length off of them. Or if it was a shallow bay, then just cover water and with the spot lock on. So the boat just holds in position and then move, you know, let the take spot lock off and drift for 40, 50 yards and then set spot lock again and cover more water and just keep covering a bay that way. And then I do a lot of lock style fishing with drogues and, uh, you know, just covering water with mostly with streamers and them. So that way, mm-hmm. It's crazy. It's a whole different world, still water, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. A whole different world, but it's a whole lot of fun, as you well know. <laughs> oh, I, 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 yeah. I mean, unfortunately, uh, it's it's iced up out here right now, but, I mean, that's just how it goes. Um, I'm sure you guys are sure. pretty close to it as well, out, out where you are. Yeah, we are uh, we had a really cold snap this last weekend. We uh, A lot of our trout lakes will start freezing probably more, Oh, early to mid December, you know, our high elevation lakes, our nine, 10,000 foot lakes are probably starting to freeze now, but our, you know, our five and a half to 8,000 foot, seven, seven and a half thousand foot lakes are uh, still pretty open. We have a lot of large reservoirs that, that stay open until usually mid December, let's say. Mm-hmm. Do you find a lot of people are intimidated by lake fishing, Lance? Oh yeah, for sure. Especially out here. Yeah. Uh, you know, most of our customers are river anglers for sure, but we, we have a growing number of, of still water anglers. Um, I find that the most, most of our still water anglers locally are trollers. They're, yeah. they like to get in a kick boat or a float tube and, uh, they just drag flies behind their, their, you know, boat of choice, if you will, they're inflatable or even just a motorized boat. They'll just wind drift or run a trolling motor and, and troll flies. And that's very productive, but there are lots of other ways to tackle lakes, as you know, and, uh, lots of ways to do it that, that are maybe a little, I think are a little more fun than trolling. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm the same. I don't troll anymore at all, but you know, we all started there. Right. Um, I think, yeah, that, I think that's, and, and I'm, I'm open to say when I first got into fly fishing, not knowing much about still water, um, it was easier to, to troll a leech or a, a woolly bugger or whatever the heck yeah. I trolled. You know what I mean? Before you start sure. understanding the structure and the, the bugs, you know, the cycle of everything and all that, how it works. But yeah, it's, it's its own beast. I love it. So when you're in the shop, right. And guys come in and they ask you, mm-hmm. you know, like, what do you, cause I'm sure you get asked in the shop all the time. Like, what do you, what are you like directing them to? They're like, Hey, I'm interested in a setup. Like, here's what I want to, you know, here's what I want to do. Are you, do you take it into like, are you going still water fishing and going river fishing? Like walk me through that. Cause I mean, you have such a different style of fishing. Like I, I'm wondering if you're going to lead someone down your own road. Yo, yeah, we, well, we just ask them what they want to do. I don't want to push them in anything I want them to do. I want them to do what they want to, you know, buy what they're going to do. But we certainly ask that question, you know, what, what kind of an outfit are you looking for? Most people come in and they've already done a little homework these days. They've looked online and most people come in and say, I want a streamer rod or I want a lake rod or I want, uh, just a workhorse five weight or I want a Euro rod specifically. If they don't offer that, then that's certainly, we got to ask those qualifying questions and say, okay, you know, what is it that you're after? Are you after a Euro rod or are you after, and some people immediately say yes and some don't know. And if they don't know what they're after, then they're probably wanting their first fly rod, which is in our area, most likely a nine foot five weight. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, we can talk about differences in rods and, 
different weights and lengths and then uh, encourage them to get started in it. And maybe down the road, we'll see them back for a rod for a specific technique or a different place or something like that. Yep, absolutely. So cool. Lance, what's next, man? I know you got uh, the videos going out, but what else do you have for us? Anything? You know, I don't have a lot coming up. Uh, we've got our next set of videos that we uh, we released, our instructional videos. I'm just kind of working in the shop and doing a little bit of guiding and trying to sneak some fishing in on my own. Uh, you know, that's about it for me. The, with COVID, we don't have a lot of travel coming up. So, uh, and so until things settle down a little bit and we get back to a normal you know, travel ability, if you will, then uh, I'm just kind of fishing local waters, which has been awesome. We have so much great fishing nearby that there's uh, there's never enough days in the week to, to go try all the places I have in mind. So that's kind of, that's my thing lately. Just uh, hang out with my wife and kids and uh, spend some time at work and then try and fish as much as possible. You're definitely spoiled, my friend. That's for sure if you... Uh... If your lakes aren't frozen up yet and you you just want to find new water, I like it. So I do have a question. You, yeah. you were supposed to go, where was it this year? It was Last year was Tasmania. This year was supposed to be Norway. Is that correct? Uh, Finland. You were close. Finland. Yeah. Scandinavia. Yeah. And mm-hmm. when was that supposed to take place? Is it January or was it now? I can't remember. Like, uh, You know, that's a good question. I don't remember for sure either. I think it was in August something like that. Oh, uh, way off. I want to say it was w- late summer. Okay. Okay. Um, huh. So I, I, hopefully that happens. I mean, hopefully. Yeah, they've got it temporarily, you know, rescheduled for next year. So we'll see how everything shapes up. But uh, we'll hope that we can get back to that kind of stuff. And, and if not, that's no big deal. We, we'll do what we need to do to get past it all and and uh, just fish locally, right? Yeah, absolutely. Support it for sure. So, Lance, I can't thank you enough, man, for being on the show. Um, super, super knowledgeable. My head is swirling from all that information. Um, if someone wanted to reach out to you, ask you questions, get involved with anything that you guys are doing, um, where could they find you at? Uh, well, I'm on social media, just Lance Egan on Facebook and at Lance Egan Fly Fishing on Instagram. Uh, I work for Fly Fish Food in Orem, Utah, so you could call the shop here or uh, you can order from us online at store.flyfishfood.com. Uh, we have a YouTube channel that has lots of free videos, so if you're looking for some more tips down the road, check out Fly Fish Food's YouTube channel. And uh, Otherwise, reach out on social media and hit me up with any questions. You bet, man. I'm going to make sure I put all that in the show notes as well for everybody. So, Lance, listeners, I want to thank you guys as well. So, thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks for listening and thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, no worries, buddy. All right. You've been listening to the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. If you like this podcast episode, please let us know. Leave a review and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast listening platform.